All right, everybody. Um, thank you again for uh, for joining us. Um, hopefully, this one goes without a without a hitch. We don't have any backup plans in case somebody Microsoft bombs us. So let's hope that doesn't happen. Uh, I will, like last time, let the speakers introduce themselves, and we want to do this in a you know orderly and respectful manner. So if you can mute your mute your things until you want to ask a question. Um, you know, unmute, feel free to ask questions at any given time. Um, each one of the, the guests here kind of represents a different angle from tenant advisory to broking to uh, to legal. <clears throat> and I think we should be able to, at least for my say, uh, sake, get a lot of clarity around sort of what the most pressing issues are for people. So I'd, I'd love to sort of have you guys introduce yourselves. And then after you go around the horn, if you could kind of share maybe the, the one thing or two things that are um, the most frequent uh, questions or, or areas of concern that you guys are seeing. And then I'd love to, I'll, I'll kick off a question after that, and I'd love to open it up uh, to everyone here who's joined us um, to ask questions. We'll be here as long as you need to be. And then obviously we're um, going to record this and try to share it with everyone. So in case you have to bow out or bad, bad internet or some other bombing, uh, you know, we'll send it to you. So uh, with that, Andy, I'd like to start with you and introduce yourself and at MBRE. Uh, thanks, Scott. Welcome, everybody. Uh, for those who were on our call last time, I'm going to be repeating myself a little bit. But um, I am Andy Davidson. I run the Tenant Rep Corporate Services Group that uh, at MB Real Estate that specializes in tenant representation. Um, have been doing tenant representation for uh, for 30 years, so I am not. Uh, a young 32 like my friend Nate, uh, but uh, but anyway, um, you know, work with a lot of startups, also work with a lot of, you know, corporate uh, corporate tenants. And obviously we are confronting um, some unusual issues with related to the pandemic that uh, look forward to speaking with everyone today about. Nate, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Nathan Miller. I work on Andy Davids's Davidson's team over at MB Real Estate on the uh, tenant advisory team and uh, represent a number of companies uh, in multitude of industries and sectors, but uh, really focus on uh, advising tech firms and startups on their office leasing needs and requirements. Adam? Yeah, sure. So, hey, everyone, this is Adam Falkoff. I am a, a leasing attorney at Quarles and Brady in Chicago. I also run our startup and venture capital team across the country. I represent about 45 startups, primarily in the city of Chicago. They range from anywhere from pre-seed all the way through exit. Some have raised no money, some have raised actually over 100 million and everything in between. But I also do a lot in both office leasing, retail leasing, data center leasing, and industrial as well. Um, and really in all different verticals right now, we're seeing these kinds of issues come up. So Scott, maybe I'll turn it back to you. and in terms of what direction you'd like us to go. Yeah, so uh, I want to let the the people in the audience here uh, kind of direct the majority of it, but I, I would love to know from you guys, you know, what is, it could be from the legal side, it could be leasing, it could be um, need, it could be concerns, um, not just about current leases, but the future of leasing. Uh, what are you guys seeing um, most pressingly right now from your clients or from your tenants or from your, you know, from your, Investments. Okay. Uh, you want me to go first? Yeah, yes. fire away. Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, the immediate need is is addressing, you know, the upcoming rental obligations. Some of our tenants are impacted much more than, uh, you know, than others. People within a startup community, their their number one concern is, you know, maintaining uh, uh, cash flow. Um, and so, uh, you know, they're, uh, they're scared. They're looking at their, you know, lease, seeing what rights that they have. Uh, I'll, I'll just kind of give you a real quick overview of what we're kind of seeing in, in, in the marketplace. Cause I think that's why a number of people are on the call. Um, you know, in general, anyone, any tenant certainly connected to uh, social impacts uh, that the pandemic has been hitting particularly hard uh, retail you know the restaurants um, any type of app tied to parking all that all that kind of hotel industry 
we are seeing landlords, you know, certainly deferring rent. No one's granting, you know, rent abatement, but I would say that certainly along the retail lines, um, you know, the landlords have been pretty good about pushing the rent back, you know, a month to, you know, three months and then asking for some type of, you know, payment plan over the next, I would say, six to, you know, 15 months. Uh, we are often sometimes seeing that they are willing to apply a security deposit if the land if the tenant has uh, put up a security deposit, and then asking them to replenish that within that six or uh, fifteen month period. And the deferment could be partial. Um, uh, you know, the landlord might look at uh, his mortgage payments and at least want enough rent coming in so that he can get his mortgage, you know, covered. Uh, and work with the tenant um, on, you know, uh, abating some of the rent, or as I said, you can see all of the rent, um, you know, being abated. And then I'll just say quickly, what, what I have seen in general is landlords are more receptive to those tenants that um, try to talk to them, um, try to, uh, you know, basically demonstrate why they've been hit particularly hard by, uh, by the uh, the pandemic, and you know, be ready to uh, um, you know show some financials and give them an idea of you know what your business might be you know going uh, you know going forward. And, and and I'm sure Adam could kind of talk to the legal you know a aspects uh, on this as as well. And he's done a lot of the work with landlords and tenants, um, and and get his take on how to approach you know the landlord. Yeah, happy to. And so Andy's absolutely right. So I'm actually on both sides of, of this fence. I'm in certain properties. I'm representing landlords who are getting these notices. On the other end, I'm working on probably about 140 or 150 tenant leases right now. And that's largely with one particular retailer where we're actually the one sending the notices. So the first question I'm getting from a ton of my clients is, is anybody actually asking for this kind of relief, what Andy's talking about, rent deferrals, rent abatements, changing commencement dates, things of that nature. And first answer is absolutely yes. It doesn't matter the property. It doesn't matter if it's medical office, if it's um, high-end class A office in Chicago, if it's retail in, I want to know, retail in San Diego, it just doesn't matter. The answer is right now is that this is rife across the board. So first, if you are thinking of making an ask to your landlord and your question is, is anybody asking? The answer is absolutely yes. Yeah, without a doubt. The, the second question really is a lawyer I'm getting a lot about is, what are my options under the lease? And where a lot of the attention is going to the force majeure clause. And I'll have to be a little bit careful because obviously I'm making, depending on the client, making both arguments in each direction. But essentially here are the arguments that people are making just from a high level. So some of you are pointing, and it really, well, First, it dramatically depends on how your lease is written. Force majeure clauses, they may, to a lady person, they may all look the same, but they are very, very different in terms of the way they're actually written. And so some people are looking to them and trying to make the argument that their rent obligation should be subject to some kind of a force majeure concept. The idea being the world came to an end, crazy things happened, um, you know, I've lost all my revenue, therefore, force majeure, I shouldn't pay rent. Some tenants are sending those notices and making those arguments. However, other leases will say in the force majeure clause that rent specifically is not subject to force majeure. And that is actually fairly common. Most sophisticated leases will say in them that payment obligations or rent are not subject to force majeure. But again, it dramatically depends on what your lease actually says. The other two questions I'm getting a lot of one is, what exactly happens if I don't pay? Like, what does that mean? I um, mean, this is obviously if a tenant is in serious distress um, and really is thinking, look, like my, I can't, I just can't justify making the rent payment because I've got to make payroll for the next three to five months. And if I don't start really curtailing my expenses, that's going to jeopardize my company as a going concern. So the question you get, of course, is, you know, if I don't pay the landlord, what are the default rights? What are the remedies? And these are always the sections that when you're negotiating the lease, you usually just say, I'll leave it to the attorneys and the attorneys just go and talk. But now, of course, if a default is a real possibility, it's something that a lot of people want to talk about and really understand. And unfortunately, it is usually the most convoluted language in any given lease. 
if you're someone who has a lease, and I'm guessing a lot of people on this call do, if you go to your default section in the remedies, it probably does not read normally. It just doesn't. They're just complex. It's usually pretty complicated with how it's set up. And of course, the third question, this is really where Andy comes in as well, is so what are my options? Um, you know, can I defer rent? Can I, what's the amortization period? One thing that we're seeing across the board, a lot of landlords saying, okay, we'll defer rent for April and May, but I want to amortize that. And what that basically means is be paid back for it uh, in the second half of 2020, or I want to be paid back for that in 2021. And let's do a lease amendment to modify the terms of the lease to allow you to do so. And there's a, almost an unlimited number of options. And retail specifically has a whole bunch of other options related to things called co-tenancy clauses and fairly specialized rights that go with retail that you don't typically see in office or medical office. But there are at least a lot of options. Now, whether the landlord will accept those options is a completely different story, but there are options there from just from a high level. And so Andy and Ethan, maybe I turn it back over to you guys in terms of Okay, so you want to ask for something. How do you do that? Like, what's the, what's the first step you want to ask for? Let's say, let's say I'm a tenant. I'm a startup that's in the event space. Um, my biggest client is Ticketmaster and Live Nation. I don't represent either, to be clear. And um, both of them, the revenue comes to a complete halt. Therefore, they say, hey, really cool SaaS software that we buy from you, but we're not going to pay you. Um, we're just going to cancel our subscriptions because there's no tickets going on right now. So your magic you know, customer software doesn't do anything for me. So my revenue drops to zero and I want to make the ask of the landlord. How do I actually do that? Well, where would you start? Well, most of the landlords and, and Nate, you can you know join in as well. I mean, most of the landlords are going to look, you know, to see some kind of evidence of you know revenue loss. So they're going to also um, be concerned, obviously, with uh, revenue loss, financials going forward. Uh, get an idea, you know, of your um, uh, business plan. I have told some in some respects that you know it might be better to pay your April rent, uh, and then you know the May rent, where you could truly show more revenue loss because um, you know perhaps your revenues weren't hit that hard in April, but much more so in May might be um, a better uh, a better story at that time. Um, and really, you know, it's it's really just a matter of approaching your landlord in, um, I, I would say, a non-antagonistic fashion, if you can do that. Um, and these things are being taken case by case. I had, you know, I, I, Adam, you alluded to this. I, I've talked to all the big landlords. You know, we obviously got relationships with them all. It doesn't matter if it's Tilo, Sterling Bay, um, you know, you, you, you name it. Um, these things are case by case case. No, nobody is, you know, de facto just issuing uh, across the board, you know, two months of, you know, deferment. Uh, they are taking these things, you know, case by case. So it's important to have a good relationship with, you know, um, uh, the landlord and uh, hopefully not getting into an antagonistic, um, you know, situation. Um, and if it does obviously get antagonistic, I mean, that's when you do have to sit there and, and, and talk, with the, talk with your lawyer and understand the issues, you know, associated with the uh, default as well. I'm, I'm going to bring up one other subject because I think this is particular also to the startups. Uh, a lot of startups, you know, tend to um, take space with subleases. Uh, subleases are their own special, you know, animal where your sub landlord is not necessarily the landlord of the building. Uh, the reason that you have to be particularly careful with, you know, subleases, especially if you are subletting from a, uh, a, a group that doesn't have good credit in itself, is that you might find yourself in a situation where the underlying uh, um, Landlord is not paying their rent, you know, either. And if he defaults, uh, then you really, you do technically, you do not have a, you know, direct contracted relationship with your um, owner of the building. And you could be in danger of losing, you know, your lease rights there. So 
you know, Adam, you might want to, you know, yeah. talk about that because, you know, oftentimes you are not directly recognized by the, you know, um, owner of, you know, the property when you're, you know, subleasing. And so that bargain deal you got might be out the door. Yeah, and I can address that. So to sort of break that down, especially if, because I do think the subleasing concept is something that to an, to non-real estate people is even that say to most real estate people is a little bit complicated with how it actually works. So think about it this way. So the original tenant, so let's say that I'm subleasing from MBRE. MBRE holds a lease with the building owner for one North Wacker and says, okay, I am the tenant. I've got a, a legal right to take this floor of the building. MBRE no longer wants the space. MBRE says, hey, look, Adam, if you want it, you can sublease from us. You can take the space for the whole floor for a certain or all of the remainder of the term. I then enter into an agreement with MBRE. Now, here's where this gets complicated, is that if you have a sublease, you probably remember hearing the brokers or the lawyers saying, hey, we got to get the landlord to sign off. They need to consent to this. So you probably do have a document, I hope, where the landlord has signed off and said, yeah, okay, Adam, we're cool with you taking the space from MBRE, no problem. That doesn't mean, to Andy's point, that I have a contractual relationship now in terms of the underlying leasehold rights or the lease rights with the landlord. So if you think about it, it's kind of a stack of cards where you have the owner's interest, which they've given to MBRE, and MBRE has given that interest to me. The problem is if MBRE goes out um, or has a problem, well, then that middle connecting part of that, of that transfer is gone. And all of a sudden the transfer collapses on itself because now I'm drawing rights in MBRE, but MBRE's in bankruptcy, right? Like they no longer exist. So I have nothing. And that's what Andy's really driving at is I'm now left in a position where the landlord can come to me to say, hey, the tenant that you got you had your rights from, they are gone, and that lease is gone. So your rights are gone too. Get out. And by the way, in the startup context in particular. It's not unusual to see sub subleases or kind of like a series of subleases as people are moving out of certain spaces. It goes all the way up the chain. So if you have a sublease from someone else who had the sublease, from someone who has the lease back to the owner, if anyone in that chain breaks down, your end result is always the same, which is you are at risk of being evicted out of the building because you no longer have lease rights. Two quick things on that though. So one, how do you prevent this? So it's hard to get as a startup, but startups come in all different sizes. So if, if you're if you're a startup that has some substantial scale, let's say you've released, I would say, of more than 10 to 20,000 rentable square feet, it's more than a year, like there's something really substantial to it. You can sometimes, depends on the landlord, get something called a recognition agreement. And what that essentially says is that if the prime tenant, the tenant that you got your sublease from goes under, you can step into their shoes and continue on. However, those agreements will often say that if that happens, you need to pay the rent that the original tenant was paying. So usually because subleases are subject to the prime lease and they're not as high quality in terms of legal rights, typically you pay less for them. So if there's a delta between what you pay and what the prime tenant pays, a landlord will often say, if I recognize you, I want to get paid just what the prime tenant was paying. So if you've got a sublease that you think is a steal of a deal and that prime tenant goes away, that steal of a deal may disappear overnight. Going back to uh, to Andy's point and, and the original question about how do you go about asking landlords for rent deferment or whatever it may be, um, it's certainly going to help your case if you show the landlord that you're doing more than just asking them for help. So if you've applied for some of these grants, uh, show that. Uh, we've had a tenant or a, or a client of ours who um, the partners at their firm are not taking pay. They've cut their pay. They're only paying their uh, subordinate employees to help uh, with cash flow issues. So um, to add that as a point, if, if there's something like that, that you or your client, uh, you know, maybe maybe looking to do um, anything that's going to help you provide more support that you're not just going to the landlords for help um, is going to is going to be better suited for you in the long run. 
Yeah, Nate, and Nate, along those lines, uh, it, it's quite common that the landlords are also asking um, and, and making sure that you've tried to pursue any type of, uh, you know, government assistance that's being offered these days. If 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 you qualify, that's 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 another thing um, that they're going to want to see. Yep. So, so another thing I also want to just quickly add is that, and this relates to the governmental assistance, is that as you're looking at that assistance, and this is a little bit off the topic, but it relates to it, is also be very clear with what the purposes of those assistance, what the purpose of the assistant is. So, for example, if you're getting a PPP loan, that loan has very, very tight limits on what you can use the funds for. So my general view is I think the more you can be transparent with your financials, at least from what I've seen from landlords on the legal side, the more transparency there is, the better off you are. Because I think when I've seen the, the letters from tenants, they basically just say, world is ending, things are bad, you know, give us rent abatement or deferrals, and there's no underlying financial support for it. It's just like, it's impossible to grant. I mean, by the way, a lot of landlords too, and just in case you see this, a lot of landlords are sending out applications um, for rent deferral, and this is especially true in the retail context. So if you are writing to a landlord and you get an application back, and usually it's like about three pages or four pages, and they'll say basically, tell us all the problems you're having, tell us what you're trying to do, fill those out. I think they're immensely helpful to make your case, and I definitely would not disregard them. And a lot of landlords, they're really unusual. I've never heard of these outside of what's going on right now. But a lot of landlords are creating applications. And the reason they're doing that is to standardize the information they're getting back from tenants. So instead of looking at 10 different responses on 10 different letterheads and 10 different ways of explaining their situation, they can actually look at them together on a single application. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you guys a question um, that a lot of the younger startups, whether it's, I mean, a sublease is probably not as as much the deal as a, a traditional lease, but many of the startups who are in the smaller category, when I say small, you know, like three to call it 15 people are sort of used to, and Adam, I'm sure you're used to advising against these kind of things, are used to sort of the like the cut and run approach. Like most of the time uh, they're operating on a shoestring. They really know that they have no uh, assets that can be claimed or reused. And they tend to think, let's just drop and run and not pay for this thing, lease in this case. Uh, to cover whatever the most pressing costs are, what happens? Sure. Or, like, I don't think people understand maybe what exactly happens in that process. Do they just kick you out? I mean, you're not in the office anyway, so what do you care? Like, what 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 happens next? Good question. So it really depends on what the lease says. So the, the, the biggest worry you're always going to have are personal guarantees. So personal guarantees, most who are familiar with them, it's pretty straightforward, which is that if there's any amount that the tenant cannot pay, the landlord has the right to go after the guarantors. But to clarify that a bit, most guarantees, if they're properly written, will say that the landlord does not have to exhaust the tenant before going after the guarantor. So and I, it may sound like, okay, you do one and then you do the other. That's not quite right. So as soon as there's an obligation that the tenant doesn't pay, let's say it's $10,000 of rent, the landlord does not need to sue that usually, depending on what the guarantee says, but usually does not need to sue the tenant first. So first, if you're thinking is- so a rich investor. <laughs> right, so right. So if you're thinking, listen, there's a personal guarantee, but they're gonna have to sue the company before they go after me. Again, depends on what your guarantee actually says, but, but generally speaking, that's not the rule. Generally, the landlord can say, well, listen, I know the tenant has no assets, so I'm just gonna go after the guarantor. The second part is, the default provision, if it's well drafted, will usually have a calculation in there, not a number, but a formula that'll say, if there's a default, there's usually two different general sets of options. One is to say, I can terminate the lease and get a liquidated damages that's often, generally speaking, equal to some sort of difference between what you would have paid and what a fair market value is. But again, depends on the lease. Or another option is the landlord can just simply demand rent every month and continue to save. But a couple of things about if you're thinking, listen, you know, there's no personal guarantee, there's just my startup company, we don't have any assets, what's really the downside to this? So the real downside is reputational. So 
Lawsuits are not private, they're public, and they're a headache. You have depositions, um, and literally the only who I've ever met who enjoy litigation are litigators, which I am not one. So, <laughs> so I hate litigation. I have no interest in it. Um, and it's just, record. A, just record. Record. It's a burdensome process. But to be clear, it is public. So if you're like, listen, no one will ever know, that's definitely not true. So when people search for the company's background or they do a search on the company, that litigation does show up. Now, in terms of the reputational harm, you know, Andy can speak all about this stuff than I can, but I'm a little bit more mixed on that. One is, I, you know, when 2008, 2009 occurred, and admittedly I was an attorney at the time, but I've spoken to a lot of attorneys who were at the time, and there was a lot of talk about no one will ever do business with this person again, this lender will never make another loan, you know, to this to the sponsor, and, you know, this will last forever. In reality, that's never the case, right? Like, if you have great ideas in the future and a great founding team and the world improves and things get better. Like I'm of the view that there is no such thing as permanent reputational damage, but that does not mean of course, that there isn't significant, at least short term or medium term reputational harm. If you are essentially just sticking it to the landlord. And of course, the other part of it is litigation as I'm sure all of you are very aware is phenomenally expensive. So if let's say you owe the landlord $50,000 and the landlord sues and goes after you, not just for the owed, the back rent, but goes after you for attorney's fees, goes after you for the commission they paid to the broker, the tenant improvement allowance they paid, the rent abatement that they paid out, and they go after you and they are suing you and you're being forced to respond to it, it is going to cost a fortune. So I am not, I'm definitely never of the view to say, never default ever, right? The reality is that sometimes for business reasons, defaults happen. That's why the default clause is in the lease. But I would definitely not take it lightly, even if it's a small obligation, just because the amount of cost, hassle, and reputational harm can be very, very severe. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mike wrote in this chat, oh, sorry, Andy, go ahead. No, go ahead, Nate. Uh, Mike wrote in this chat, he had a question, um, and it's a good question, and sort of goes to uh, the underlying issue about, you know, landlords and, and their, I wouldn't say uh, inability to be flexible, but, you know, they're, they're sort of stuck between the tenants needing relief and having to pay their mortgage and their debts. Um, so while the landlords, yes, they are the ones making these decision decisions um their hands are a bit tied because they can't just go in and you know defer and and make changes to contracts because they have obligations to their bankers and um you know those institutions that have brought, provided them debt so adam have you had sure. any discussions with lenders on behalf of landlords and if so what are they hearing as to the debt forbearance or restructuring on that side so yeah, good question. Uh, really good question for the person who asked. Um, yeah, so there are forbearance discussions that are going on with a number of our landlord clients and on the lender side with our borrowers as well. So the answer is yes, those conversations are happening, but they are moving slowly. They like we do have, we are working right now on some amendments to loans where we're putting in forbearance agreements, we're buying time for landlords to meet their obligations but they're, they're much slower. To me, the landlord-tenant discussions are moving much, much quicker, like by light years, than the lender conversations. And the reality is, is, that, you know, is that the leverage is going to change over time. And, and I know there's a lot of right now writing about, you know, that tenants essentially should be the ones in power and be the protected class. But Nathan, to your point and to the, uh, the attendees' point, at some point, the buck stops somewhere. So if it doesn't stop with the tenant, then it goes to the landlord. If it doesn't stop with the landlord, it goes to the lender. If it doesn't stop with the lender, eventually it goes to the shareholders or the bondholders. So it does go all the way up. But right now, the lenders, at least in my view, are largely in a wait and see kind of approach. I don't think they face the urgency yet. Because I think most landlords, at least the ones that I'm aware of, are still paying the mortgage. So the first shoe to fall has been tenants not paying rent. And we just haven't had enough parties yet not pay the mortgage 
that'll then trigger a wave of forbearance agreements. I think that's partially because the lenders have much, much stronger rights over the landlords than the landlords do over the tenants. And I think that's partially what's driving it. And the tenants are the first party not to pay. And it takes time for that to go all the way up the chain. Yeah, yeah. and Adam, you know, I'm sure you're seeing, um, I, I could tell you just talking to some owners, uh, the guys who have CMBS, you know, debt, which has been, you know, securitized, it's, it, it's really hard to get any kind of direction in those instances from their um, from their lenders. I mean, they're just not, you know, being, uh, you know, being responsive. So a lot of times it depends on who is, you know, the lender on, on, on the property as well. Yeah, completely agree. But I think to the reader, to the viewer's point, and Nathan, to your point, I do think that it's just, as you're talking to your landlord, keeping in mind that the landlord is still paying taxes, still paying utilities, still paying insurance, still paying a mortgage, is I think a really, really important dynamic to remember. Because if you say, well, my landlord's a jerk, I asked for you know two months of rent deferral and the landlord yelled at me and threw me out of the office, that may be what's in the background. Is there may be personal guarantees on the loan. There may be cross collateralizations with other projects. There may be a lot more to it than just a, land, a, a greedy, the classic greedy landlord who wants their money. There may actually be a lot of very, very real pressure on the landlord's financials that is driving their inability to, or unwillingness to quickly make a deal. Yeah. And, and Adam, I think, you know, when we say landlords, we're, we're, we're kind of talking about, you know, these big, you know, entities that, that, that we think are, you know, institutional and own the high rises. But you, you also got to remember that, especially in the startup world, some of you are in smaller smaller properties where your landlord might have signed personally on some loans and have a real, you know, crisis on his, uh, on his hands, you know, as, as well. So, um, you know, these things can, can vary just depending on, on the lender and the type of building you're in and, and, um, and the tenancy, you know, makeup, you might, you might be in a building that's, you know, 90%, you know, small, small tenants that aren't you know as financially sound as another building that is 90 percent occupied by you know northern northern trust yeah completely Andy, i've got a question for you um and also i want to remind everyone who's who's listening um feel free to to either text in a question or just shout out that you've got a question directly we want to make sure that you're being covered as well um for people who were just about to sign a lease or who were looking to sign a lease about a month ago, what are the recommendations for them? How should they prepare for this? Uh, are there things that they should hold off on because there's opportunities when anytime something like this happens, there's opportunities. Um, just what are your general thoughts? Yeah, no, I think it's a, I think it's a good question. Um, I'm actually, you know, involved with a, uh, a law firm break off right now. Uh, great, great time to start a, a, a new, a new law firm. <laughs> It's not Adam, but new lawyers. <laughs> but um, you know, one of the things that uh, one of the things that we've that's come up is, uh, and they're doing a complete you know new build out as they're occupying um, uh, temporary space. But one of the things that we're doing is that they are going to sign a a lease, but they're going to have a contingency clause that. Um, uh, they can make a decision on moving forward for the next 60 days um, until the you know construction and the TI starts to actually you know fund um, because in this type of pandemic you know as we're obviously seeing a 60 day time frame uh, we're, we might have a much better picture of you know the entire fallout and whether we're getting back to you know, business as normal. So, um, you know, the landlord in this case has been open to the idea that they could, you know, back out of that that lease, uh, provided that they actually haven't started to pull down on funds and and um, uh, associated with you know the TAI. So, I think you can look at contingencies like that. I think you can look at contingencies that are tied to perhaps you know downsizing within a range. Um, if you're signing a lease for 10,000 feet and, you know, you might want a range that says 
in the next 60 days, I can make a decision, you know, whether seven to 10,000 feet, as long as you're leaving, you know, the landlord a, a portion of space that is leasable. Um, I think you've got to look at some things that are tied to construction and timing. I, I, I would ask Adam some of these issues. Uh, I would be careful of, you know, anything associated with delay that isn't, you know, covered within your lease that this delay doesn't fall on your uh, on the burden of the tenant if it's COVID-19 related. You are seeing some, you know, delays in the supply chain, um, some things that are just out of your, you know, control. So um, I think you're going to see more, you know, contingency type of, you know, clauses inserted that give tenants you know, some flexibility. And I think landlords are more open to those type of, you know, issues because they're just happy for any type of activity going on. And, and in general, the market has kind of, you know, shut down um, and things are just kind of being, you know, held in, held in place for, for right now. Um, I, I will tell you some of the good news uh, is that, uh, look, the market is definitely from a tenant perspective, got to get much, you know, better as far as, you know, overall rates. Um, we are already seeing dramatic decreases in construction pricing if you're involved in, you know, heavy construction. Uh, so, you know, from that standpoint, it's, it's going to be a, a more, you know, tenant oriented, you know, market. Um, maybe Adam could talk about some of the things that he's, you know, seen on, on the leasing side. But I, I think obviously landlords are going to be much more flexible than they were, you know, recently when the market was quite, you know, heated. Yeah. And, and I think Andy hit on a lot of the main points. The one thing I'll add to that, and this gets to his, Andy's point about delay, is the, for, the way the force majeure clauses operate with landlord delivery obligations is probably one of the most heated conversations I'm having with parties right now. And so to give you just an example of it, so let's say that the landlord's building out your space and you'll be in the space August 1. Your current lease runs out July 31, and you're thinking, well, okay, great. So I'll be in the space on August 1, this will work out, or something along those kind of timelines. Well, if the lease says that obligations are delayed, um, if something occurs beyond landlords' reasonable control, or frankly, people like us and other landlords' councils are dropping COVID-19 specifically into the force majeure clause, then the landlord has an, a very strong argument to say, hey, look, I was going to build your space out on time, but the city of Chicago prohibited build-outs. And so as a result, um, your space is three months late. I know we said that if I missed August 1, that I would give you, you know, a day-for-day -day abatement every day. Essentially, every day that I'm late, you get a free day's worth of rent, but COVID-19. And so as a result, your new delivery date is November. Well, the reason that's a catastrophic situation as a tenant is that your existing lease is going to have a holdover clause. And if you don't negotiate, it's usually 200% rent. And so if you're thinking, well, wait a minute, they're not giving it to us November. What are we going to do? We signed a lease, so we've got to move. At the same time, we have 200% rent starting August 1, what do we do? And so that's where if you're negotiating a lease now, that's where you really want to talk to the attorney and say, I really want to make sure that the delivery is airtight because I don't want to be in a position where the landlord misses delivery obligations. And as a result, I have holdover rent um, and I don't have any recourse to the landlord because of a force majeure clause. The other argument that some tenants are making, admittedly that we're some is making too, is to say, if you're negotiating delivery obligations today, there's, I think there is also an argument that people are making to say that delivery should not be subject to COVID-19. The idea being that when we negotiated the lease in April, we all knew it was COVID-19. It's not like any of us thought that there wouldn't be COVID-19 when the build-out was occurring. So therefore the build-out in the delivery damages should not be subject to COVID-19 or, or pandemic issues. But the general point is that you have to look for this stuff. So if you're like, look, it's a lease, I'll read it, I'll sign it, not a big deal. And you're like, it says right here, if it's not delivered August 1, I get my rent abatement. It's not that simple and you just have to be really, really careful. Yeah. Um, so I've got, like, we have 15 minutes left. Um, and I obviously, again, please interrupt if you have other questions. 
Uh, I'd love to get your insights across the board here. Uh, I would say on Adam's side, it's more of like what you're thinking based on the the, the different array of startups that you represent. Andy and, and also Nathan on this in particular on like just what you're talking to different tennis and, and building owners. How do you see these things impacting the way we office? I don't know if you guys saw this, but um, um, why am I blanking on the the uh, real estate firm that just put this out? But yesterday there was, I'll look it up and tell you guys which one it was. But um, yeah, it was, uh, I think you're talking what uh, Cushman. Cushman. Yeah. yeah, got it. Uh, so Cushman put out this piece basically saying, you know, bye-bye bullpens. Uh, we're going to have kind of a change to how we design and lay out our offices. And, and there's sort of two sides to that coin because there's already been – uh, prior to COVID, there was a lot of startups themselves and, and companies in general who were sort of like getting sick of the the wide open, everybody's communal kind of thing. Do you see changes both in design and expectations and size of spaces being taken uh, as it relates to the number of people in that space? And or do you see any shifting away from, you know, maybe basically people w- welcoming this remote working environment more? What are some of the things that you guys you know, or that are not like snap reactions, but like actual thoughts that you think would be uh, potentially changing the real estate market going forward. Okay, uh, I'll take that first, and then I'll I'll let Nate, you know, because we might we might have differing opinions. Yeah, I, I it, the, I've seen varying opinions. I, I I would tell you, you know, my own. Um, I actually think that it's not going to change as much as people think. And and primarily because um, any type of change, especially for existing leases, requires a lot of upfront cost uh, to make those changes. I don't see in bad times companies investing a ton of money redesigning, you know, their their space to accommodate, you know, the social, you know, distancing. Um, what I do see, again, and this is a less expensive way of doing it, I think because of downsizing, they are going to have less people where they may, you know, remove, you know, furniture to promote the social, you know, distancing. But, um, you know, as far as investing a lot of money to um, uh, accommodate some of the uh, safety procedures, I don't see that happening right away. And quite honestly, you know, from pandemics in the past, and I've been around long enough to see it, you know, in general, people go back to the way that they've been, you know, working um, in in the past. I, I, I will say you'll see changes with respect to leases, uh, the clauses, the way they're going to be, you know, negotiated. Um, I'm not going to say there's not going to be any effect in the design. Uh, I think one interesting thing is in the disaster recovery area. Um, that may change. Disaster recovery, you know, second uh, for bigger corporations, certainly tend to be, you know, kind of a benching scenario where they could put 200 people right next to each other, um, you know, in the case of some catastrophic uh, event like a hurricane, earthquake, and they got to go out to the suburbs or something along those lines. Um, you, you, might, you, you might see stuff where they might put in studios, Scott, so they can communicate to their employees and clients. Yeah. That's not often, you know, done. Um, so, you know, or you might see something with, with some of the, you know, bigger, bigger tenants, like, you know, let's take example, Uber, uh, you know, who just put their construction on, on hold and, you know, it's certainly good and, and and they're going to be, you know, subleasing some of their space. You might see a portion of uh, the spaces where they might set aside a portion uh, aimed at such events like this, where they can have social distancing and they can have some of the workforce come in and work under a safe environment. Um, I could see some of those discussions going on. But right now, I don't see any, you know, heavy upfront cost. And if you notice, you know, all these new designs, account for much less density, which I get, but that is adding a significant, you know, cost. That means that, you know, they're going to be taking on 20, 30 percent, you know, more space than they were, you know, from before. And I think that's a tough sell right now. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, I don't disagree with, with uh, 
with Andy, you know, we've heard of companies that, you know, when it's appropriate to go back to work, that, you know, half of their their group will work in the office one week or two weeks, and then the other half will will go in the other two weeks. So, you know, I think immediately I don't I agree with Andy that companies who already have space and are well into their leases aren't going to necessarily pay upfront costs to modify the look and feel of their spaces. But that said, you know, to Andy's point, companies like Uber and Google have put their construction on hold and you know it may very well be because a maybe they're not hiring as many people as they thought they were going to hire in chicago um or b maybe they're rethinking the way that their office is going to look um with these current events um you know i don't think that you can ever um get rid of the social interaction that people have going to work but i do think that you know the flexibility with work and people working from home and whatnot has always been sort of trending as more flexible and i think we'll continue to see that but i don't think it's going to completely alleviate or take away from the fact that companies need offices and will still need the majority of their workforce in an office to operate at you know optimum uh capacity so my personal take, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of take a little bit of a contrary because I, I disagree a little bit. So I, I do think in the startup market, there's going to be two changes that I think are going to be long term. I think the first one, and these are really going forward. I think the first one, and this is keeping in mind that most startup founders tend to be between the ages of, say, roughly 25 to, say, 40. It's kind of the bulk of your startup founders. I do think there's going to be an increased reluctance to really invest through the lease um, and to take on a long-term obligation and more space. And I think to me with this, the echo for me at least is the housing market. Now admittedly the housing market has not gone back to pre 2007 numbers for a million reasons. But I do think that there's a lot of writing that psychologically millennials just have a very distrustful view of housing, um, of owning, not obviously having housing, but owning a house or owning real property, partially because of damage from the rest of the last recession. So I do think that for a lot of startups that feel like this, and this is what I'm hearing from my own clients who are saying, look, this came out of nowhere. Like I, there's a million reasons I thought my startup could have failed. This was not on the list. I think these kinds of fixed costs, companies are gonna, startups at least, are gonna be increasingly nervous to make because they're just going to have a psychological nervousness with anything that is a multi-year significant fixed cost. When you can have something like this, they go from having a nice 2000 square foot office and then overnight all of a sudden you can't afford it. So I do think that anything that's multi-year commitments, just a, doesn't matter if it's what it is, but in this case it's a lease, is going to have trouble. I think the same thing, and we're admittedly seeing this in the law firm context, and that's right with startups, is that there's just so many managers, I think, in senior leadership that have always said, you can't do this from home. I need you to be in the office. Mm -hmm. Within the law firm context, that is like literally like half of our real estate group and a big chunk of our firm that have always sworn for years up and down that you could not do this remotely. So my view is this is the largest future of work experiment that not only the US but globally has ever occurred. Um, it's almost an unfathomably large future of work experiment. And so I personally think that when this all ends, a lot of middle and senior managers are going to be surprised by how well this actually worked. And I think within the law firm, I'm hearing this constantly, which is we all kind of thought that this was going to be catastrophic. Not obviously for it's not good for the firm to have these circumstances, but we thought that there was no way that a law firm could just operate from a bunch of people's homes around the country. And it's working. Like it's not ideal. Um, I'm literally sitting in a nursery right now, which is why you see the striped colored paint behind me. But it's a very nice chair. We have the very same one. Yeah, this is right. So if you have if you have young kids, you might recognize the chair. I'm saying it's super comfy. Um, but my general view in terms of long term is that I really think people are going to lease less space. I really do think that 
for all of these managers who said you could never work from home. Even that manager who said they would never take a day off is working from home today. And I just think that that is going to have a sea change, especially because if you look at the birth rates for millennials for when they're having kids, we're just starting to ramp up on that curve. And so I just think there's, especially for whether it's maternity or paternity issues, there's just going to be an increasing push to work remotely, but also an increasing willingness of managers to say, yeah, that's okay. You just did that for three months or four months or however long this goes, and you're just fine. So yeah, I'm fine with that. Whereas last year, I would constantly hear, you could, you can't do this remotely. And now we are. I'd, I'd love to echo um, and respond somewhat to Adam on that. And obviously, Andy, and you guys chime in as you want. Um, I talked to like a half dozen, maybe closer to 10 CEOs of different companies from around the country in the last week um, about this exact topic. I'm trying to write this little piece on this sort of the, the future of work remote and I agree with Adam on the sense that there are there's going to be a push to work remote in areas that they never, all of the managers previously said, no way, that'll never work. But I, I disagree uh, that the spaces won't still be leased. I actually think they'll be leased the, probably once we kind of get past the shock. Um, and of course, once we get you know into pig mode where we have all the money again, then we'll do whatever we, we do. We always do that. We always you know get extravagant. I think the spaces will all be leased. I think that they will be used in different purposes. I think how we use our offices, particularly around uh, if we're working more remotely, it's very similar to uh, a couple of CEOs who wrote some pieces on LinkedIn recently about uh, that they're not going to do everyone working in the office every day. They're going to do retreats and they're going to have purposes for people from around the country to come into their office and that office will serve a different purpose. So I think that they'll still have the space and they'll still use the space. It'll just be used a little bit differently over time as an evolution. That's that's just what I'm hearing from startups. That's not, you know, Chase Bank. That's not these big, you know, companies that have been around forever. That's a different story. Uh, but I, I really do think that a lot of, I mean, even some of the founders I've talked to, like, um, you know, he's not on the call, so I'll say his name. <laughs> Sean, uh, Sean from Centro, uh, Sean Ricksecker, I had him on the show and he was talking about the office in New York and the office in Chicago. And after this happened, and he was like, you know, I never had an opportunity to really rethink what could we do with this space? All I ever viewed it was as like, you know, like everybody else, conference room, kitchens, seats to sit at. He never thought of it of like, what potential did the space have? And, and I think that you're going to find a lot of CEOs looking at like, wow, we could create a lot of cool experiences for, for our team, for our customers, et cetera. So I don't know if you guys have other thoughts on that, but I, I side with Adam on the more remote will happen, but I, I do think that there's other opportunities for the space to be used differently. Yeah, here's here's one thing that I will will say, and I think look, it's I think these are all good points. I, I will tell you before the crisis happened, if if anything, we saw the kind of experiments with with home working, at least with a lot of the larger you know corporations that had a lot of their people working from home. There actually was starting to have significant pushback on that. Um, so, you know, they actually started uh, insisting that their people, to some extent, come in. They found that, you know, there was a lack of uh, culture and identity with, with, you know, the company itself. They were concerned about high labor, you know, turnover. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, you know, it's funny. My son is a programmer. God knows he works from home all the time. And he's he's actually here with me, despite the fact he works in New York. So um, to Adam's point, I think it's different for different, you know, generations. Um, but I could tell you that there was a little bit of pushback, you know, bef you know, before this. And, you know, when the economy was really heated and labor was tight, there is something about the office space creating a culture, the whole socialization aspect that can't be easily created, you know, from home. We're doing our best. God knows I'm trying to play every game I can, you know, with my with with my group and keep them busy and you know, all those good things. But there's just something about, you know, uh, coming into the office space, impromptu meetings, impromptu, you know, running into people finding out what other people are working on that can't be duplicated. No, I agree. I think that that's been the, I would say the number one pain point for us. And we're obviously a small team, although I work, you know, as you know, you guys know with 
of a larger family office. Um, team, Microsoft Teams has been great. The ability to drop in, you know, we use Slack, but on the other portfolio companies, we use Teams. It's very easy for me to have a question and quickly pop on and do a one-on-one -on -one face. Um, but the amount of times that I have sat there for hours and like, man, I can't think of this or I can't do this or I can't do that. Or, I don't know what my next move is that would not have happened if I was in the office because I would have literally just turned around and you would have reminded me that you're the person that I need to talk to. Right. That kind of stuff. There's just not a, there's not a valuation that you can place on it. You only know it when it's not there. Yeah, and I could I, I could just tell you quickly. I know we got to wrap it up. That you know, I've done a lot of work with the advertising agencies and groups like that. That you know, when people are walking around the office and they see a new ad campaign that they weren't working on, they go, "Oh, that's an interesting idea." You know, yep. so um, and and their spaces have been designed for that type of interaction. They want people to be you know gathering in certain places to promote, you know, discussion and, and ideas that they may not be aware of that the company was working on. So um, I, I agree. We have all learned to work from home. It's going to be a bigger, you know, part of the, you know, discussion going forward. Um, people are going to be taking, you know, less space, main, mainly because of the economy uh, as well. But uh, there are things that you just can't replace uh, easily replace, uh, you know, uh, as far as actually being at, you know, the office. And in general, I think we're social animals. So I'll, I'll conclude with that. Um, awesome. I, I appreciate it. I think um, the only topic that we left off the plate here, uh, we'll have to do another one of these four, is uh, is what's going to happen with co-working and the we works of the world. But we'll save that for another day and another, another, another conversation. Um, I want to thank you guys all for, for joining us on this, both the audience as well as the speakers. Um, we're going to share this, right, Nathan? I'm going to try to put this yep. together and, and share it on the, in, the, in the world of internets. Um, and then I'm sure you guys, if you want to message back and forth, can get uh, in contact with Andy, Nathan, or Adam. Feel free to message me or email me at katunatechnory.com, and then I can facilitate those if you need them. Otherwise, I think a lot of you already know these folks. So uh, thanks so much, Pale. Thanks, everyone, for coming in. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for putting it together. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Good Cheers. job, guys. Thanks. Take care, guys. Thank you. Take care. Have a good stay. Stay safe. Stay home. Thank you. Too.